Hello, uh, welcome again to the building track of Drupal South. Um, so we've got Adam uh, here, and probably one of my favourite contracts was uh, working with Adam, I have to say. We had a very, very interesting goal um, of doing some cool stuff with Drupal 8 uh, where we wanted to deploy from, from Git um, content. Um, and pretty much, there was conceptually it was possible to do that, and but basically Adam was like the hero of the piece. Don't want to like trump him up too much, but uh, yeah, Adam did some pretty cool code on that project, and I'm really excited. Having been away for six months or so from that project, I'm really excited to see the presentation today, see where they've gotten to. So, um, can you please welcome Adam? Thanks, Sai. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about some really exciting stuff um, that I have been working on for the past almost a year now. Um, config and content as code, mainly content, because we all know that Drupal 8 has got this great thing called CMI. Um, and around how we ditch that old canonical database. So let's get straight into it. Um, going to go over the problem and the motivation behind this kind of thing. Why would we want to do this in the first place? Um, a little bit of our infrastructure overview of how we've got AWS set up to handle this kind of thing. Um, just so it's a bit easier to explain the principles behind it. Um, then we'll go over the project timeline, what we started with, some great groundwork from uh, the main man here, Simon, and what we've got now and what our future is looking like. Uh, give you a rundown of our toolkit, all of our uh, uh, libraries and things we use to help out with this kind of thing, and then I've got some amazing people to shout out, and then I'll open the floor for questions. So, uh, yeah, problem and motivation. So, the main idea of this was everything has to be code, content, config, um, the whole shebang. We've got all of our infrastructure as code as well. Um, and we wanted to get away from this idea of a canonical database in Drupal. Um, does anyone not understand the idea of a canonical database? Yeah, okay. So in Drupal, you've always, uh, well for me personally anyway, you've always got this idea of in production, you have a database and that's your source of truth. You nurture it, you hold it, and you back it up and you don't want it to go away because if it does, you're screwed. Um, and that's great. I mean, uh, it's how, we, how we're used to dealing with things in Drupal, but what if you didn't need that? What if you could spin up an entire website just from a Git repo, um, not having to back that up, that database up every hour or every day or however uh, you happen to do it? Uh, we also, so in saying that, we need to support a highly available and scalable environment. We need to be able to scale out for load and scale back in. And you know, if a web server goes down, we need to be able to spin one back up to the point in time um, that it last was, or the content needs to be there. And that needs to happen without that database backup. So how do we actually do that? Uh, we've also, being government, um, we've, I think I forgot to mention that. I work for the Department of Justice. <laughs> that is a crucial piece of information. Um, so we've got uh, compliance requirements we've got to meet. Um, we need to, someone comes to us and says, on the 23rd of September, you guys had this piece of information on your website and it wasn't quite right. Um, with a canonical database, how would you um, go back to that exact point in time and be able to um, audit that, um, and you know, uh, verify what they've said is, is correct or um, or not. Uh, so we are able to, with our um, content as code, spin up a a site at any point in time um, using using Git. Um, so yeah, that meets our audit trail and freedom of information um, requirements. There, uh, we wanted to be able to manage our changes. Um, be able to package content, config, and code all as one. So um, we might have a large feature that contains um, you know, a new landing page, and that landing page has 
a cool map on it, and that map is made of a view, and the view is built from a module that we've added to the site. Um, and we want to be able to package all that stuff up, um, the content, the config, and the code, the modules and everything, into one release and release it all at once, rather than writing update hooks to add content, um, import the config and all that. So, you know, there's, there may be a case where we have one of those large features and it's sitting in approval for three months. Um, uh, we need to be able to uh, handle that and have that sitting there waiting for approval and once everything's all good, merge it in and go live. Um, and also roll back, so if something goes wrong, we need to be able to roll it back. So that's all kind of um, why we want to be able to do this, right? So now I'll give you a little uh, glimpse at, a very little glimpse, at what we, um, what we use in our infrastructure to support this kind of model. So per site, we have a single build server and he's the guy that runs the tests, builds the packages for deployment, um, has a testing site on it if we want to have a look at um, those builds or see why the tests are failing or not. Uh, we've also got uh, UAT and production environments for each website and per environment we have a separate authoring site. So that is one of the crucial pieces of this whole infrastructure, being able to have that separate authoring site um, where people log in and author content um, and having completely separate uh, web front ends or uh, view servers as we call them um, on an auto-scaled um, AWS infrastructure. And so each environment has automated content config and code deployments just through Jenkins. Um, and those happen nightly um, to UAT, or they can happen manually um, when we see fit. Uh, the content gets deployed um, every 10 minutes, and I'll take you through a little bit more of that process later. So the project timeline, what we started with. Now, for me, when I heard the about what they wanted to do in there and um, our architect's vision for this. Honestly, I thought it was a bit crazy. I, Simon and I, I remember sitting in a room um, multiple times thinking, is this really going to be possible? Are we actually going to be able to export everything on a Drupal site into our code and have that be able to be imported on another website? Um, and spoiler alert, it is possible. Um, it's pretty hard though. Um, so, challenge accepted. I'm gonna do this shit. Um, and we started the long, long process of getting where we are today. So, CMI, it's very dear to me. Um, I love it. And thank God Drupal has it, because I don't know about you, but features, it would <laughs> yeah, yeah, enough said, right? Um, so, I mean, CMI is so, you know, the smooth dependency resolution, um, for the most part, you've got, you've still got the ability to override stuff in settings.php files, so, you know, you have your settings, we, we have our settings.uat.php, and that's where all our UAT stuff goes, um, in terms of, um, login credentials for external uh, dependencies and whatnot. And it really allows us to keep all of our config consistent across all of our sites so, um, and all of our environments. So we actually use um, yeah, one, one uh, group or folder or directory of con config for everything um, and then just use those settings.php files to override the Um, right, so config, yeah, we got that for free, awesome. We can export it, we can import it, looks like that, cool. Now, this, <laughs> Entity Pilot. Um, who has had any experience having a look at Entity Pilot? 
apart from you guys. <laughs> um, so basically what Entity Pilot allows you to do is package up content into flights, so departures and arrivals. Um, so it automatically calculates dependencies for you. So you say, I want a flight containing the About Us page, and if that About Us page has a menu link and a taxonomy term and all the other bits and pieces, it knows that it's got to export that all as well. So Entity Pilot basically allowed us to um, extend its transport mechanism. So um, it sends its flights over HTTP, HTTPS, and um, the way it's architected means we can just say, hold on a minute, write that to disk, or read from disk. Um, so that was basically why we chose Entity Pilot to do this. We looked at things like default content or deploy, um, but the way Entity Pilot's um, written and architected really allowed us to extend that. Um, it's also really actively maintained, um, Mr. Lee Rollins, legend, um, and it met our requirements for those packages of content. Um, Drupal 8 and Symfony. Awesome. We could, um, we could use the Symfony services and swap that piece out, um, that transport mechanism, um, really, really simply. So um, that, was a, that was a really good win for us as well. So here's a little snippet of something you can do, and you just say, uh, here's a service, entitypilot.transport. Um, you're actually going to use my class now, and then all we do is override the methods for getting and um, basically getting and setting those flights. So Symfony really allows you to take something awesome that someone's done and mold it into what you really need. Um, so that was a really good win for us as well. So enter Entity Pilot Git, which is my pet project. Um, it's what I've been just ex describing. So it's, ex uh, it's replacing that uh, sending over the web with uh, sending to the file system. And what you can see here is a what we call a manifest. Um, so when you export something, it writes this manifest file. It says we've got um, some contents. In that contents, we've got some block content and of type simple content, and there's two pieces of content in there, and it just lists the UUIDs. Um, so these manifests allow us to uniquely identify at any point in time what is going to be on the site and what can be exported or imported. And it makes the content extremely transparent. We can, I can look at this and say there's two blocks in this manifest, and if I were to import this, I'm going to import those two uh, pieces of content. And what do those pieces of content look like? Well, they're just JSON files. Um, so on the right, you can see our content uh, directory uh, nested by entity type and bundle. And all the files are just named by the UUID. Uh, on the left, you've got um, an example of one of those blocks earlier. It's got all its fields in there. Um, it's basically just a serialized uh, version of that entity. And it's yet to be open sourced. Sorry, it's coming though. So with that all out of the way, we've got the config and we've got the content. Now there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we've got to be able to do. So to make everything deployable, basically everything has to be related by a UUID. So one of the first pieces of uh, work Simon actually did on this was to write the UUID condition module. So it allows us to place a block um, by UUID um, instead of path. Um, that guarantees us uh, that we're going to, um, we know that block is going to uh, show up in the same place on every single site or every environment rather than rel um, relying on a path. Right, so we've got blocks, we've got config, we've got content. Cool. What about images? Everyone loves uploading images to Drupal sites or files, documents. 
especially in government. So um, Intermedia DB was chosen as a digital asset management solution. Basically gets us away from having to mount a file system um, or sync files between environments, kind of that kind of thing. Because remember, we've got that separate authoring site, separate um, view websites. If we're uploading an image to authoring, how do we make sure that's represented on that live website? So I ported the Enbridge module to Drupal 8. Um, that's an example of searching for an image um, and basically just are able to choose the images from that DAM solution and directly uh, use them in your Drupal site. And this is using um, Core Ajax modal windows, by the way, which are really awesome. So that's uploading an image in a field. What about images inside content? So Enbridge CK added a module, allows you to um, embed content, uh, images and assets inside that body uh, content. So we're getting there. We're almost there. What about links on for pages? Um, Node slash NID links aren't going to be deployable because you can't guarantee that Node ID is going to be the same on the other website. So we got in touch with the guys at Previous Next um, and worked out a solution for deployable links and menu links as well. So this is a node. I don't know if you can see that, but it's. Um, it's being displayed on its UUID URL, and that basically means we can have in-page hyperlinks to um, content and um, yeah, show that piece of content without having to rely on a, an NID path. So yeah, thanks Previous Next as well for continuing the work on getting these into core. Um, it's been a long process. And menu links as well. So menu links uh, by default here, this is an example of an export one, are uh, on the node slash NID URL. Again, that's not deployable. So we need something to target that UUID. So that's actually um, uh, normalized at export time and then denormalized at import time and finds its own, uh, it's a real NID in the project. And that actually supports um, link fields as well. So we're pretty much there now. We've, um, we've got our config, we've got our content, we can place some blocks, we can upload an image, we can link to a piece of content, and we can have, we got menu links. So that's pretty much a standard Drupal site. Uh, but we've gone a little bit further since then. So that was basically what our first site started with. Um, but then we started getting these more complex requirements, like what about collections of fields, or as they're now known as paragraphs. Um, if you haven't used this module, awesome. Um, so we now uh, export, can export and import paragraph content um, through our, uh, our export and import uh, trans, uh, transport. Aliases, so an alias in Drupal is actually considered a computed field. So normalizers actually ignore it. So um, by default, it's not exported. Um, so we've got that now and um, wrote a cache submodule for the Enbridge uh, module, which basically means if our digital asset management um, solution goes down or has any issues with connectivity, um, our site can still serve those images locally um, from a cached URL. So it works very similar to image styles in Drupal, um, where it'll generate that image the first time, write it to disk, and then serve it from disk um, for the subsequent requests. Cool. So that's pretty much um, that's pretty much what we've got now in terms of uh, deployable content. So how do we actually do all this stuff, and how do we, what do we use to deploy um, and manage that kind of content workflow? Quite a lot. So we've got Jenkins. Um, Jenkins is 
been coined as the heart of our project. So it, um, it keeps the blood flowing, it keeps all of our code and our content flowing through our environment. We've got Bitbucket, which is the brain. It's, uh, it knows everything. It's got uh, all of our content, it's got all of our config, it's got um, all of our library dependencies, composer files, it's got our Ansible tasks for um, infrastructure. And then we've got our terminal helpers, um, console and Drush, uh, to, to alleviate the sort of the pain points of um, doing that kind of stuff over, over Jenkins. Uh, we're using PHP unit and BHAT. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> um, just a side note. I am starting to look at um, what Sam was talking about yesterday, the browser test space and um, all of that awesome stuff now. Um, <laughs> BHAT is really accessible for people that haven't had much um, experience with testing though, so that really worked for us. Um, and it's, yeah, but you know, it has, it has its limitations. <laughs> um, so Ansible we use for all of our um, infrastructure, um, so all of our uh, web servers get provisioned by Ansible, or oh, using Ansible, and we use that as well for development environments. Um, so I believe we borrowed heavily from um, a talk you might have seen yesterday, Beatbox and Drupal VM as well. Um, so we've got our own um, Vagrant boxes and using Ansible and stuff like that. And thanks to those guys at Beatbox, uh, with Beatbox and Drupal VM for helping us um, get that done. And finally, the biggest toolkit known to mankind, AWS. Um, we yeah, heavily use a lot of AWS services like um, obviously EC2, we've got S3 in there, um, just started using CloudWatch and Elasticsearch and stuff like that. So now I'm gonna briefly explain how all this stuff uh, fits together um, with some flow diagrams. So how do we do a code deployment um, using this kind of uh, methodology? So we go, hey Jenkins, would you mind merging these two branches together? And he goes, all right, with his smug little face and goes off and um, does some tests. Can I merge that branch or those branches together? Um, if there's conflicts or any problems with that, it fails. Uh, he then checks, is there any content to export? So we've got like a, a JSON callback that checks the site if there's any content um, that's been updated since the last export or created. If no, then we're all good to merge. So we spin up an entire separate machine um, next to our authoring website. We merge that um, code together, we run all of our tests, and if everything's all good, then we can merge and deploy to our actual authoring site. So that's, that's how we uh, manage feature releases. So <laughs> what about content? So every, co every 10 minutes, Jenkins checks that same health check. Hey, is there any content to deploy yet? Um, if there is, cool. We export it and also the config as well, because we allow uh, our site owners to you know, edit config, some config. Um, cool, we got that in code base, let's create a release, we'll push that out in Git, um, and then basically do like a blue, green, black, white, red, blue swap uh, with the view servers, and one at a time just deploy those, and then uh, we've, got the, we've got that new content. So that's taken care of. Um, the last little piece of kind of cool stuff we do with, with all these tools is our pull request builds. So um, code review is a big part of our process. And um, to, to release a, a, a new feature to, to build or develop, um, Jenkins sees that there's a pull request up. Um, you might be familiar with something, this from something like GitHub. Um, deploys that branch. Um, to a, a build server, runs the tests, and since all that content and all that config is there, 
it can just simply run a site install and a, config, a content import. And then we've got a, a working website there that we can go and have a look at um, and yeah, basically see um, that everything's working correctly. And then Jenkins tells Bitbucket, hey, that was a good one or that was a bad one, and we don't let bad ones be merged. That's really handy. Cool. So that's basically it. Um, we have six live websites right now. Um, and there is another 29 to go. <laughs> um, so one awesome thing about this platform is it really allows for rapid development. We have what we call a vanilla build where um, all of our base uh, build for the site or the, our sites live. And getting that initial build going took us about six or seven months. Um, Crime Stats was our sort of guinea pig for that. And then we've just been able to bang out sites ever since. Um, we've got a couple more in development right now. Um, and yeah, as I said, there's a lot more to go. Um, for context, we have a um, team of three developers, two of those are front enders, and um, three ops guys that work on the, the background, background stuff. Cool, so what's in it for the future? Well, I've got to get LDAP sorted. Um, we still haven't quite met our vision of absolutely no canonical database. We do have to back up for uh, user passwords and, um, and another thing which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we're going to be starting to abstract that content out of our um, main repos into, its, into their own dedicated repos for better release management. As I said, we want to get to this node database backups point of view. Um, right now, yeah, we've got the user passwords in there, but also revisions. So um, another huge piece of work that previous Next is helping us out with is adding UUIDs to revisions. Um, currently, when you normalize a piece of content, you only get the, the default um, revision. So if it's published, you get the published version. Um, if it's unpublished, you just get the latest, whatever's the latest version of it. But we want to be able to export um, the entire history of a node or a portion of the history of the node. Um, that way, our authoring environments can be completely um, on demand. If, uh, you know, out of business hours, we don't really need that authoring environment to run. We can shut that down, um, not even bother with a database backup, just make sure everything's committed to Git, and then bring that back up and have all that um, content in there um, just as they left it. Um, so what this is going to be able to do is, yeah, as I said, on-demand authoring, um, cost saving um, there, we have, you know, less servers running the better. Um, and some sites that we run only actually edit content like once or twice a year, so there's not really much point having that authoring website up and running all the time. Um, that, that's going to lend us to be able to have different charge models, so we could um, uh, you know, have a different model for 24-7 authoring or um, on-demand authoring. We get into things like dashboards for spinning those up and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, yeah, there's a lot of performance uh, improvements. You can imagine going from exporting one, uh, one entity per node to exporting, um, you know, maybe 10 revisions per node or hundreds, even if um, your content authors make lots of mistakes. Um, so there's a lot of performance uh, improvements to do there. And we want to get to a point where we can you know, have a new site coming onto the platform and completely script the whole um, base of our, of our build. So the Git repos, the, the config, the Jenkins jobs, everything like that, just so we're ready to go as soon as we need to. Cool. So, last but not least, I need to give some shout outs to some awesome people in the community that have actually helped this project come to life. So firstly, Lee Rollins, um, author of Entity Pilot, um, has helped us out tremendously on IRC um, and previous Next. I've 
been doing amazing work with all that UUID um, kind of patches the core and, and helping us get that um, and kind of realise that. Um, Simon Hobbs, he was the initial engineer on the project and actually was responsible, I hear, through the interview process of getting D8 into the, the Department of Justice. Uh, <laughs> um, Drew Gath, he's our architect and he's, that, he's the one with that um, grand, grand plan, and that dream of having everything in, in code. Um, and Samantha Presser is our superstar on our team, does everything from front end to uh, BA work, um, works with our clients, um, and obviously everyone else at the department that's, that's kind of made this project happen. Um, so if you want to get in touch with me, I'm pretty much AC Bramley on everything apart from Twitter, because someone took it. And those are the three issues that um, I've talked about today with the uh, involved with UUIDs and revision UUIDs and stuff. So if you want to get involved, jump on those. And that's it. Anyone got any questions? Just one quick cool thing. The whole thing's auto healing, which I love. So even the Jenkins is still the case. Like if every if if the Jenkins box go down, they're all completely auto healing. So um, yeah, that's pretty cool too. All right, who was first? Um, just a, a very quick question, Adam, that's interesting, but can you tell us about how many nodes are exported, say, in the Crime Stats database or any of the others, if you know? Yeah, so I think Crime Stats, last time I checked, had about 120 nodes. So, yeah, the sites that we're working on, we're kind of working from uh, most simple to most complex. Crime Stats, while it's not the most simple, it's the most um, feature-rich in terms of what we need for the whole platform. So, yeah, we've got other sites. I think um, in the future we've got a site coming up with, which has something like 1,500 assets. Um, so all that's, you know, we're getting there in terms of the number of, the sheer number of content, but, yeah. Yeah, the second one, yeah. Uh, good talk. Um, I originally saw Sai do this, um, the original part of this at DrupalGov, um, and it's been one of these things that I've been really waiting to hear the conclusion for for some time. Yeah. I'm going to ask the question that I asked Sai at DrupalGov, um, which is, when does it come to the community? Where's the release? <laughs> so, um, yeah, honestly, it's... I could release it now, and um, but I just want to make it a little bit better before, before getting it out to you guys. Yeah, um, just to put that in context, I really think the main part, the main component is the, the Entity Pilot extension. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with the Entity Pilot extension you could see uh, effectively like a prototype Git repository with just a, just a composer file. Um, Another thing that I loved about this project is we got away from make files completely and we did the whole stuff with um, Composer, which, you know, it's difficult at times, but, but yeah, it's pretty cool. So you'd end up seeing a repository with effectively just a Composer file, um, some basic structure. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. Uh, next. Um, looks like a fantastic idea. Great vision. I think it's good that you're getting somewhere with it. Um, in the past, doing things like doing migrations from Drupal 7 and importing a lot of content over, yep. I've seen things where content imports take a long, long time. Yep. With having all that content, if you've got a big site with a lot of content, what kind of effect does that have on the performance of your install bringing a site up? Um, obviously, the more content, the, the longer it takes. It's still, it's still loading those entities and building them up and, um, and looping over everything. But what, that's one of the things I'm going to look at soon is how we improve that performance, whether it be bat, uh, batch or queuing or, um, you know, right, right now we actually export everything at once and import everything. Um, what I want to get to is on an existing site being able to import only the, what's changed, so that'll speed it up. Um, but yeah, we have, I mean, I haven't seen any severe impacts of the number of content um, right now, but I know when, yeah, as I said, when I switched on the revision UUID stuff, going from 
um, importing 120 pieces of content to importing uh, one and a half thousand. Um, yeah, there were some performance issues there, but that was that was around memory issues um, rather than sort of the time it takes to import something. Yeah, uh, great work on this. I've been chatting to Sai about this as well, but uh, I was wondering, have you looked at using uh, you know, the deploy module and multi-version and those suite of modules in D8 to actually be able to kind of syndicate this uh, content out to other sites? So if you had D8 sites that were too small to really kind of do any work on, or other D7 sites being able to actually use this model, but push the content out to other sites that still use it. A database. Um, it's not something that we've actually we have looked at yet, but it is definitely possible. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty good idea. Something that I'll take in mind. Um, yeah, and just on that as well, there's a couple of architectural constraints that we we chose to adopt right at the start. And one of those was we have one site, um, one one site effectively in a repository on a branch that you know. And so it wasn't like about syndication. We're not a news. It wasn't a news corporation where we want to like send to multiple websites and spread that content out. Um, so there's things like that and around the size as well, like it was like, well, there's going to be a point where it doesn't scale, you know, and existing models are still valid, but for the majority of these sometimes brochureware sites at, at Department of Justice, like, the model makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Lee. I think this is the same question I asked Simon as well last time. Um, obviously you went through a selection process for Intermedia DB. Can you guys share <laughs> the, because that's an open source. Right? Oh, God. No, that's an open source, <laughs> right? D a DM, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, obviously, you guys went through a process of evaluating DAMs and just how you got to where you got to. And, uh, yeah, that would, I'm looking at that you, would help so. others. And are you using a, like a hosted solution for that, or are you guys running we're, it we're on hosting it, own yeah. hardware? Um, yeah. It is interesting. It is an interesting product. They've, I've got some cool stuff. Um, once, when I came on board, that, that selection process had already been done. Um, I think there is a larger vision to what we want to do with the digital asset management solution, but we've kind of got to, we've got to work out a lot of kinks with that product um, right now. Um, if it was more of a... If it was a bit simpler in, in terms of requirements, I probably would have done it with something like S3. Um, I think it would have been a lot, a lot smoother. But um, yeah, for now, Intermedia is doing pretty well. Can I, can I ask one? Um, on, on one of the slides you had earlier, I think it was the deployment pipeline for, for production. You had view one and view two down the bottom. Yeah, so if I'm reading that right, that means like one view stays in place while the content's being ported for the new one, and then you just hot swap the two of them because the database yeah. is cattle, not pet type. Is yeah, yeah. So each server has an onboard database. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so one's get one gets taken out of the load balancer. Um, that uh, does a a pull. Uh, sorry, an extract of the um, the latest release. Does a uh, I think Compose is already installed. Does an import of the content then just hot swaps that, does it to the other one, then puts them back. So with the question that uh, Bevan asked about how long it takes to import, does that kind of make that moot? Because... You, you Absolutely, know, yeah. It, so it doesn't really matter yeah. how long. Um, in our case, anyway, it's right, anyway right now. Um, we would like to, um, and we have had requests, to have that content um, deployment process a bit faster, but I think... Yeah, for us right now, it's, yeah, as you say, it doesn't really matter how long it takes because it's not actually serving the site right now. Yeah, it could, uh, so the only reason it's two is because that's what our auto-scaling group is set to. Um, if we were to bump that up to five today, um, it, the site would continue working. It would just build all those servers from the code base and away you go. Nice talk, um, nice idea. Um, I think it's the reverse of migration, uh, like file to uh, D8 migration kind of thing, in my opinion. Uh, so uh, is there a plan to, you know, 
uh, convert that to a proper thing like uh, in the migration we always do you know from file to d8 or something d7 d6 we have the modules for that in contrib and now in core yeah. and uh, this will uh, actually give you uh, the ability to import you know a as soon as d9 will come you can import your data to you know d9 instead of mm -hmm. d8 because you can always use serial as and stuff so is there a plan for that in place um i mean it's not something i've thought of but yeah as you say it's definitely possible you could um just for example if it was you could really do it with anything you could just implement your own normalizer because all it is is um in that denormalization process as long as that returns an entity whatever it may be at the beginning um yeah it could be used for something like that for sure so another question like uh, from my uh, uh, you know experience with entity pilot it's a complete product of you know importing data from one side to another and yeah. so on and so forth uh, are you just using it as a uh, you know normalizer repository kind of thing with it yeah yes. sort of so it it does a lot of the work for us with the um stuff like the dependency resolution um being able to package that content, um, normalizing it. Um, Entity Pilot has a lot of, so, so Core has a lot of normalizers in, in, in it itself, um, but Entity Pilot takes it to that next level, being able to um, you know, normalize things that don't exist yet. Um, so it's got like a unsaved UUID um, plugin where um, say if I've got a node and that's referencing another node, and node, this node is getting imported before this node. It knows how to how to figure that out. So, yeah, it's basically for all the normalization and stuff like that. So, uh, are you still uh, using uh, Drupal UI to add all the content, or? Yeah. So our, our authors still log into um, the authoring website. They do like a normal uh, Drupal authoring experience there, and then that gets exported and pushed to our, our front ends or servers as we call them. One last thing, uh, it's just, <laughs> I'm, I, I know it's getting ridiculous, <laughs> but I think uh, uh, in uh, Drupal uh, 8, it is very good for whole, you know, uh, Drupal 8 uh, workflow because we are now able to use it for REST applications and stuff like that. So uh, you are doing it, you know, for your type of sites where you having, uh, you are having the content in the repos repository, but, you know, I think it's, for the rest application and stuff like that, it's a pretty amazing thing. So thank you for that. Thank you. I was going to introduce the applause, but you've got two in front of me. So. Thanks, yeah, thanks, Adam. That's awesome. <laughs>